right, Georgi Dinkov, thank you so much. A pleasure to have you, man. Um, to Thanks anybody for who's not uh, watching this for the first time because they searched for Georgi Dinkov, Georgi is uh, hands down one of the most astute um, people who's sort of following and championing this bioenergetic model, which I'm sure you've probably heard him or maybe Danny Roddy speak about in the past. Um, and ever since I heard Georgie start talking about metabolism, especially coming from a sports background, I realized that he was really going to be a wealth of information in terms of uh, maintaining the, the health of the individual in light of exercise or sports, um, because that was something that uh, you struggled with. And uh, if you want to take it right from there. So uh, the, the question I had really is like, at what point, what was the turning point for you that was like, bioenergetics is a better explanation, is a better model? When did you really start adopting and buying into this? Uh, when my health started falling apart. Uh, I mean, basically I was, uh, in high school, I was a power lifter, not so much bodybuilder, but most, mostly a power lifter. And I still maintain some of my bulk from high school. Um, and uh, when, but when I got to college, I started doing rowing because, you know, I, I was I'm originally from Bulgaria. Uh, weightlifting is very heavily emphasized there. Uh, we used to have some of the best weight, weight Olympic weightlifters in the world. We probably still do. Um, but, you know, the endurance sports are not so well uh, emphasized, not so much emphasized in Bulgaria. But when I came to the United States uh, in college, I found out it's mostly endurance type sports, right? There's basketball, there's football. Um, there is like, uh, um, there's rowing, there's uh, 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 track, well, field and track, right? Um, there's cross country running, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, I didn't have that many options. So I joined the crew team, which is essentially an endurance sport. It really grueling actually, because it combines the intensity. You can think of it as a high, it's, it's, it's the type of HIIT exercise, right? High intensity interval training except that it lasts much longer. <laughs> I mean, you basically, you have two types of, usually two types of, uh, uh, of rowing events. One is a 2K event, 2,000 meters, and the other one is 6K. Um, so the, two, the 2K uh, event lasts between five and six minutes, uh, and you're really rowing at a, at, a, uh, you know, at a max power. You basically, you feel like you're about to pass out you know, any second. And then there's the 6K event, which you're rowing, uh, rowing at a slightly lower intensity, but it, it, this, this goes on for 20 to 30 minutes. So you expect it to maintain an 80% of the intensity of the 2K event, but it lasts for about 30 minutes. So that that 6K run, that six, uh, not run, but that 6K event is, in my opinion, the most grueling exercise you can subject yourself to, short of an Ironman triathlon or anything, you know. Uh, but I think these are just un, unhumanly gruesome. <laughs> uh, it's just, uh, unless you're, this is your career or you really have something to prove, I just don't see what kind of a person in their sound, uh, sound mind is going to, you know, voluntarily join one of those exercises, uh, one of those events. Anyway, so I wrote for three years in college. I was relatively successful. We, we reached uh, uh, the finals on NCAA Division One in 1998. Uh, we, uh, my boat placed second. So, you know, I was in fairly good shape endurance-wise, and when I graduated in uh, from college in 2003, I wanted to ma continue to maintain that uh, I thought was a you know good physical shape. So the closest thing to rowing outside of college uh, was running. So I picked up running um, and I stayed with the endurance sports. Uh, I basically kept running six to seven miles, four to five times a week, sometimes even six times a week. And this went on and on until about from 2003 until 2008, 2009. And then I started getting these, uh, you know, strange symptoms. I was getting uh, numbness in my extremities. I started having trouble sleeping, etc. And around the same time, I also stumbled upon the keto diet uh, and also decided to go low carb at the advice of my doctor, by the way, who said, oh yes, this is such a great thing. It's got a lot of promising research. I don't think this is that big of a deal. Uh, my, my primary care physician used to do research on, on ketogenic diets for treatment of epilepsy when he was in medical school. So he, he was a very, he, he held the keto diet in very high esteem. So I said, try it out. So I went low carb combined with my already, uh, uh, you know, surging symptoms of, of energetic deficiency, which I didn't know at the time that that's what they were. Uh, and for the next six months to about 12 months, I basically continued to do the exact same grueling schedule on top of my work as an IT security consultant, which was already grueling. 
uh, you know, 10 hour work days was the norm, uh, usually six days a week. Um, and then I kept running uh, six to seven miles, you know, four to five times a week. And I also went low carb. I mean, needless to say, now looking back, this was really crazy, but it took about a year for me to fully collapse. And, you know, just one night I, I woke up in, a, uh, you know, it wasn't even a nightmare. It was just a, this absolute terrifying experience. I woke up and like I, for, for about good five to 10 minutes, I didn't even know where I was. So I freaked out. I went to the doctor. I said, listen, I don't know what's going on. My extremities are numb. Uh, they go numb at night. You know, they go, they go numb randomly during the day. Uh, they tingle a lot. And the doctor said, hmm, uh, you know, it could be MS. So he sent me for an MRI. Uh, the MRI came back clean several times, actually. And he said, um, I don't know what to tell you. We cannot diagnose it as MS because you have to have the lesions in your spinal cord in your brain. And if you don't have those lesions, then we basically, we're going to call it like, uh, I don't know, idiopathic, like mental or something. I said, how can my extremities tingling be mental? And he said, well, I'm not saying it's mental. I'm saying it could be, uh, I forgot what, uh, psychosomatic. Uh, right. You know, maybe because you, you're worrying too much about your health, you're, you're bringing these symptoms upon yourself. It just immediately sounded like a lot of baloney to me. And I said, this is crazy. He said, well, I mean, there's nothing I can do for you. You know, if, if there's no structural damage that we can diagnose. And right then and there, I kind of realized just how, how uh, powerless medicine really is unless you fit into one of their categories. So if you show up there and you have a, you know, obviously easily diagnosable trauma or some kind of a structural damage, they'll immediately diagnose it and then, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll put you on the, on the right, right track, which really means managing your symptoms. But if they, if they can do even that, then they're completely powerless. And all they do is they pass you around from one specialist to another. And every specialist is afraid of trying to do too much, something too invasive because you may sue them, right? And many people do. So they, they just keep passing you around and hoping that over time your condition will either deteriorate and you get you go to, you're going to go to the ER the you know the emergency department which are and they're usually pretty good at diagnosing but they're going to put you through a battery of tests a lot of radiation they'll probably image you your whole body they will not let you leave without a diagnosis um, or they'll hope like the, the the specialists hope that your condition will improve it'll just stop bothering them um, so for about uh, after after I collapsed basically for about another six months, I just did, did not improve. Um, and, you know, every doctor was telling me, I don't know what to tell you, but it's, we don't think it's physical. We don't think it's mental because uh, I, as a part of my security clearance, I had to undergo psychiatric evaluations. Those came back clean, so to speak. I didn't have anything that the psychiatrist thought, you know, was worrisome or needed treatment. So they just kept, you know, shrugging and saying, like, I don't know what to tell you. You know, let's, let's just give it another month. And this went on for at least six months. And then one day I was searching, uh, I, I noticed that aspirin was relieving my symptoms. So one day I was searching about aspirin and inflammation um, or aspirin and ATP, I think was the exact search. And then Dr. Pete's site came up. So, you know, I, I read that article on aspirin brain cancer. I think that's how it actually titled and immediately clicked. I just felt like, you know, whatever this guy is saying, it makes sense for the first time ever probably. But definitely more makes a lot more sense than what my doctors were, were saying, um, and they weren't saying much. They were just saying, "Ah, let's give it another month. Go see this other person." Then the other person says, "Like, I don't know why they send you to me. I don't think you need to be seeing me. Go see somebody else." And you know, I started. I immediately reintroduced carbs, and just like that, my at least my sleep symptoms immediately disappeared overnight. Right? I was not able to sleep properly, and 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 had that issue for at least two three years prior to that. And overnight, just by reintroducing carbs, I was able to sleep without interruption, without waking up, without shivering, without having nightmares, without having to wake up and pee three to four times a night. All these things disappeared overnight. So the, the fact that the aspirin helped, the fact that the carbs helped, and these two things were explained so well how they work together in Dr. Pete's article, that's what kind of set me on, the, on, on this pathway. Needless to say, within a day, I'd, I had read already all of his articles, right? Um, and um, a little bit of a background, like when I graduated from college in 2003, I graduated with a degree in uh, computer science. But at the time, um, basically just off, after the dot-com crash, nobody wanted to touch people with a computer science degree. So I was forced to take a job as a bioinformatics specialist, which really meant a coder for, for, for you know, software that deals with proteins and genes and whatnot at a 
a biochemical outfit called the National Biomedical Research Foundation. They're the ones who create, created a website called uniprof.org. Um, it's a fairly large project. I, I was actually the, the developer of the backend search engine to, that to this day is used on their website. If you go to uniprof.org, you'll find out I was part of the group. I was one of three IT people, so, but the other 47 were all biochemists, MDs, PhDs, whatnot, but they're all biologists, biochemists, doctors. So between 2002, actually, in 2005, I worked with that group, and because I wanted to, I kind of got interested in what they do. I started going out with them to happy hours. I started getting involved in their work. Um, so I started attending courses that these people were teaching at Georgetown University. Um, so I, I basically had about three years of exposure to physiology, endocrinology, and biochemistry. So that's what gave me the background to be able to understand Dr. Pete's article, which I found in 2009, 2010 timeframe. But, be, you know, the reason, you know, the background actually that, uh, you know, the, the uh, uh, it, not educational because I was, I never actually had formal education in biochemistry, but the lingo, so to speak, the, I acquired the lingo by working with some really famous biochemists in the 2000, 2005 period. So anyways, back to Dr. Pete, read all of his articles, uh, actually started started cross checking and and you know verifying the references that he has in the articles. Started digging more into that into that idea. Found out the, about the book uh, called Cold War in Biology. Then found out that there's an entire theory out there that's basically it's always been more or less suppressed. It's 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 always was taking the second seat to the genetic theory, right? And then little by little, it became clear that. Even though we are told there is like a, a picture that's 100% correct and it's the correct way to do things, life is a lot more complex than that, and it doesn't. There's a there's a huge field out there that's that's unexplored, and nobody wants to explore it, at least in the current medical industry. And it has to do with with the biochemical energy, with the energy that our cells produce from food, uh, using oxygen is essentially the acceptor of electrons. So you think you can think of us as internal combustion engines. Um, and instead of gasoline, we actually burn food. But the process is really the same. We oxidize food. And in the process, we acquire energy and a lot of the raw materials to maintain our bodies. One of those raw materials being protein. Awesome. Yeah, it's funny listening to you uh, talk. You were like, oh, well, my health declined. And then that was when I realized and then, of course, your health declined, but then you went on the keto diet that further tanked your health. Exactly. And that totally mirrors uh, my my experience. And then I'm listening to you talk about the stress that you were under. And I got to say, it took a hell of a lot less stress to break me, you know, because I went when I went uh, low carb or zero carb for the first time. It took me about six months before I just had to stop and realize I had created a much bigger problem in my health than mm -hmm. diet. Yeah. And I was noticing genuine structural deterioration, you know, because I had been doing strength training for so long and basically had a had a grasp on what my energy and structure should feel like. And then six months into no sugar, it wasn't even no carb, it was just no sugar, but it was also low carb. And of course, my brain wasn't working very well, <laughs> but but at least I finally was able to uh, realize that my structure and my energy had significantly deteriorated. Um, anyway, thanks for sharing all of that. So I think one of the coolest things about you right now is that you're doing your own research. So yeah. if you want to maybe plug some of the studies that you're most jazzed about right now, I'm very curious. Um, so uh, I reached out to uh, a number of different labs because I realized that, uh, you know, I started getting into the Dr. P's work in the bioenergetic field around 2010, 2011. And uh, most of that work initially was reading studies voraciously. I mean, I don't know how many tens of thousands of studies I must have gone through by now. Um, but at some point you realize you're just rehashing other people's work. So there is no direct way to know, no matter how well a study is done. And Dr. P actually makes no secret of that, that you know, many of these studies are biased. Uh, many of these studies are actually flat out false. Many of these studies, uh, the title and the abstract and the conclusions don't match at all the actual results. If you actually go and read the study and you, you're sitting there absolutely shocked and saying, hold on a second, you, this picture here shows that the compound you administered killed the mice with cancer quicker than the placebo. Yet you're concluding 
that there is no statistical difference. Are you kidding me? <laughs> but you know, so you over time you realize that the really the only access to truth is through experiment, uh, to the actual ultimate truth. Um, so at some point, if you want to verify some of those ideas in the in the in the uh, uh, in the bioenergetic field, uh, you have to do the studies yourself. And one of the biggest criticisms that Dr. Pete endures all the time is that people say, how many studies has he done himself, right? It's all about discussing other people's work. Now, he's a genius at that, at a savant level. But the criticism always is, listen, you keep saying that experiment is the ultimate source of knowledge. How many experiments have you actually performed yourself, right? So I said, okay, let me fill in that gap, at least for myself. So I reached out to a number of different labs, some of them in the United States, some of them in China, and some of them back in my home country, Bulgaria. And of all the places, ironically, uh, even though the Chinese did offer the best pricing, uh, logistically, legally, and in general, uh, just the whole bureaucracy of doing those things turned out to be the easiest, the combination of all these factors, the easiest place turned out to be Bulgaria. Um, I wanted to do things in the United States because it's, it's, you know, it's closer. I thought I'll be able, there are plenty of labs in the DC region. Um, I even reached out to some universities, but I found out that many of the people here and not criticism to the United States because the same thing actually happened in Bulgaria and in, and in China, most of the people I reached out to, they weren't really interested in doing science. The, for the first question is who, who funds you, right? And I said, me, really? That's really suspicious. How the hell can you fund yourself? This is insane. Who, like, where are your government grants? Where are your, uh, gr where are your, uh, you know, grants from Big Pharma? Like, uh, who are you? Like, and oh, by the way, and you don't have degrees in biochemistry. We know we want nothing <laughs> to do with you. <laughs> you it's probably some kind of Nigerian scam. No offense to the Nigerians, but like, I actually, I was told a few times, like, are you from Nigeria? Is this one of these Nigerian prince things that I, we need to send you like 50k and you're gonna give us back like 50 million? I said, no, none of that, right? I just want to conduct a study with rats and I want to test, let's say, pregnenolone, right? Or progesterone. Well, what do you want to test it for? Well, I don't know. A, a bunch of different conditions. Let's start with cancer. Oh, well, no, no, no. You, you can, we can't really do that. I mean, um, so why would you want to test a female hormone for cancer? So, uh, you know, you immediately run into this wall where basically the people you offer, that you're offering to pay to do work, they keep telling you, that's not how this is done. We don't want to do it. We don't want to get in trouble. And the only reason we will we will be willing to do that is if you pay a premium because, number one, you're nobody in the biochemical field. And I admit it, right? You have no degrees. Nobody has heard of you. Number two, it, it is highly suspicious. And take that for whatever that means. I don't even know what it means. It's highly suspicious that you fund your own work. And it makes it even more suspicious that you're trying to work with chemicals that we, the experts, believe will be completely ineffective for cancer. And you have these bizarre theories that progesterone has non-genomic effects, which are connected to metabolic energy. And those non-genomic effects will have bigger impact on the health of the animal than the receptor theory that we're such big experts in. And I said, yeah, oh, you know what? Go to hell. <laughs> we're not going to work with you. That I got told by at least seven different labs in the United States to literally go to hell. One of them said, we will work with you if you pay a premium. And, and then uh, the last one, I think, tried to do a background check on me because without me giving them any information, they go, uh, clearly they can Google my name. They found out who, who my professors were, that I was working at uh, the National Biomedical Research Foundation. So I started getting these emails and phone calls from my former professors and coworkers saying like, what did you do? Did you get in some kind of trouble? And I said, no, why? Well, we keep getting these really, really strange emails and calls from, from people who don't even know, who don't even, who don't even want to say their names, right? They say, oh, I'm Dr. John. Uh, we're going to keep it at first name basis, on a first name basis here. And uh, I want to know about your former student, Georgie. <laughs> so that one lab did a background check on me, but even, even they, they came back and said, um, yeah, that's, it just doesn't add up. Like we don't, we don't want to, we, we can't risk it. If you pay us a lot of money, we'll risk it. And I say, well, what's a lot of money? Oh, um, you know, just to consider an experiment, even if it's just like, even with 10 rats, they wanted me to sign a contract for $50,000 paid up front um, and sitting in, in, not even in escrow. You pay them 50 grand that they get to use however they want to. It's sort of like a, I don't know, insurance policy or whatever. 
And then you start discussing things like they, they wanted me to hire a, a researcher on a full-term basis. So you have to pay a salary somewhere in the vicinity of $100,000 to $120,000 a year for a person to be dedicated to working with you. That's still, we haven't even gotten to the experiment. Then you have to add the cost of the animals, have to add the uh, cost of equipment, um, additional hours for bureaucracy, uh, timekeeping, et cetera, et cetera. Basically, you're looking at, at a 250K a year for them to be willing to work with you. Um, and I said, I'm sorry, I just, you know, this is ridiculous. If I had 250K, um, I don't know. I mean, I, would, I, I wouldn't retire, but I, I don't know, probably write a book or do something else. I wouldn't be necessarily trying to, you know, do, do these studies myself. Uh, I'll hire somebody to do it. And they said, well, that's what we're for. We are here to for you to hire us, for us to do the work, um, and, and that's it. That's all. Um, I said, well, I guess it's not working out for me either. Long story short, reach out to the Chinese. Um, what is different difference in culture? They actually had even more restrictive requirements. Um, that I had to basically divulge, uh, submit to their background check, um, and then you know, agree that every study will start with a disclaimer that this study is done for the ultimate glorification of the Supreme Minister of the Chinese Communist Party, some some stuff like that, which I'm not even joking. That's what they said. They, every study will have to have the disclaimer at the bottom. And you will have to say that even though you work in the United States, this is like, a you know, an independent Bulgarian slash European study because they didn't want to to publish something that would turn out to be sponsored by an American company, namely mine, right? And then last stop was in Bulgaria, and I hit some of the same obstacles there, but I managed to, uh, uh, one of my uh, childhood friends, his mom works at the Bulgarian Academy of Sciences. She's now retired. So she put me in touch with some researchers there. They were just as suspicious as the Americans. I don't want to, you know, I don't want to put the Americans down. They actually, it, it, it looks like it's like a cultural thing in that field, the biomedical field, people are very cautious. They don't want to risk their reputation. And they, don't, they don't much care that you're actually going to pay them. But after about six months of wrestling, I first, I did a study on the combination uh, on our product, which is, uh, the name is Corinone, but it's basically a, a, a combination of progesterone and DHEA and its effects on a very lethal uh, leukemia in mice. Uh, so that was the first study we did. And then we did another study with uh, our product Oxidal, which is a methylene blue based product. Um, and a bunch of studies were done with that. Uh, one of them was uh, the antiviral effects of, of methylene blue. And I think this is very, uh, you know, uh, it's uh, very uh, uh, timely considering the, uh, the current pandemic. And the researchers there were careful. They didn't say that methylene blue would directly cure the virus, but they did say that it has a universal antiviral effect because all viruses, all viral infections depend on the so-called cancer metabolism in order to take hold. The cell is usually highly, almost immune to a viral infection if the cell is in a highly energetic state uh, and produces energy through the oxidative phosphorylation pathway. So the, the only cells susceptible to a viral infection are the cells that are, uh, that are stuck in excessive glycolysis. In other words, overproducing lactic acid, also known as the Warburg effect, and cancer cells are the same way. So since methylene blue, at least temporarily, reverses that effect, um, the studies with Oxidal and in general methylene blue that the Bulgarians did show that it should be, it should be a universal remedy against any viral infection. Uh, they didn't go as far as to say COVID-19. They just said coronaviruses, rhinoviruses, Epstein-Barr, et cetera, et cetera, but people can read between the lines. Uh, we have another study which is uh, still ongoing. It's the combination of Oxidal, namely methylene blue, and another product, which is a fatty acid oxidation inhibitor, we call it Pyroset. And again, it's for the same type of cancer, that lethal murine leukemia. Um, and we're also synthesizing new chemicals similar to the drug meldonium, which many athletes know. It's a fatty acid oxidation inhibitor, and athletes use it for per performance enhancing purposes. But through my research and Dr. Pete's writings, and in general, the publications that are available, there's a strong uh, uh, trail of evidence that uh, that shows that demonstrates that cancer is actually a disease of excessive fat oxidation and not excessive glucose oxidation in fact cancer cells love oxidizing fat which makes them waste the glucose and convert it to lactic acid because it cannot be metabolized so ergo uh, inhibiting the fatty acid oxidation pathway seems to be highly therapeutic in cancer and many other diseases 
And uh, there's some publications uh, about meldonium slash mildronate that are already demonstrating those effects. So we, what we did is with uh, another group uh, from the one of the Bulgarian universities is trying to synthesize chemicals that are, work the same pathway as meldonium, but are about 50 to 100 times more potent and more and longer acting. Um, so some of those chemicals are already synthesized and are right now undergoing both acute and chronic toxicity studies in mice. And the next step is to test them again on cancer. So really, that's I'm basically trying to verify some of the fundamental tenets of of, of, uh, of the bioenergetic theory, namely that the oxidation of fat is a universal stress signal from the environment and that all kinds of diseases can prop up seemingly out of nowhere if you maintain this uh, state of excessive fat oxidation for long enough. Conversely, if you inhibit the excessive fat oxidation, and keep in mind, we're not talking about completely blocking fat oxidation because at rest, your muscles prefer to oxidize fat. But when this process goes out of hand and continues for too long, you're basically, through the Rendell cycle, you're blocking the oxidation of glucose. That glucose gets converted to lactic acid. And the Warbuck effect, postulated more than 80 years ago by the double Nobel laureate uh, Otto Warburg, turns out that the Warbuck effect is also a cause. In other words, lactic acid is also something uh, known as something called an oncometabolite. It actually causes cancer if the elevations of lactic acid continue for too long. In other words, the longer you continue oxidizing excessively fatty acids, the longer you're going to maintain the state of higher lactic acid. And the, the higher chance that some cells will basically start changing structurally, no genes involved and no, no, no need for a genetic change, that the cells will simply start dismantling their mitochondrial apparatus until the only thing that remains inside the cell is just a glycolysis mechanism. And that's really the cancer cell. That's all there is. So we're trying to reverse that process by blocking one of the pathways known to lead to it, which is the excessive oxidation of fat. Uh, another pathway that leads to it, you can try to lower lactic acid directly. That's what methylene blue does. Uh, another thing you can do is you can try to block serotonin, cortisol, an uh, estrogen, a number of these different mediators of the so-called stress field, which universally lead to deranged metabolism. And the, uh, the characteristics of that deranged metabolism is the wastage of glucose. Instead of glucose getting converted to carbon dioxide and water and synthesizing ATP in the process through the highly efficient pathway of oxidative phosphorylation, the disease state is universally characterized by excessive glycolysis through which you waste the glucose you elevate lactic acid and also characterized by excessive oxidation of fat. So any chemicals that are known to interfere with that sickness metabolism and or promote the healthiness metabolism, which is the proper oxidation of glucose, we're interested in and we're, we're going to synthesize some of them from, from scratch. Uh, others are already existing. We're going to test them to verify, to confirm, to corroborate some of the statements of the bioenergetic theory and Dr. Pete's, right? And then we'll see, we'll see where we are at the end. That's fantastic. And I think you did a really good job uh, in, in choosing. It's kind of a, a wise strategy to shoot right at uh, cancer, you know, and establish the, uh, the premise that you're starting from, which is that cancer is a metabolic derangement rather than this, you know, genetic thing. Um, also, it just comes to mind how you have, it's sort of like obesity and diabetes, then cancer in that yep. order as this cascade where first you have the uh diabetic state where you're sugar wasting and right. you know the di the diabetic as i imagine i've heard you say uh like they just they pee out sugar they, their yep. body wastes sugar yep. and then eventually that's the healthier adaptation and then cancer arises and that's when the cancer metabolism sort of takes over all of those calories that they're otherwise would be excreting. Um, so we're talking about alternative health and you know, it's like there is health uh, care and what the FDA approves. And then there is this big mess of a conversation, especially on the internet about al alternative health and <laughs> what that may or may not entail. And so people have all sorts of crazy approaches and reasons why their supplement brand or their supplement approach or their detox protocol or, or their exercise routine is going to be the one. And 
if you start reading uh, Ray's work, if you listen to you, if you listen to Danny, you'll and you've never heard about it, you'll be like, wow, these guys talk a lot about hormones, right? And that was one of the big things I noticed at first when I was listening to you. It's like, all right, this guy's really making a point for for hormones being uh, a point of focus that other people don't talk about. So could you uh, give like an elevator pitch to why we should be thinking of the hormonal state and the endocrine uh, function? And also like this uh, idea that not just your endocrine glands secrete hormones, but that all your tissues can actually produce hormones themselves. Yeah. So uh, one of the first things that, that got me thinking about hormones is uh, almost every person knows that uh, the most popular type of cancer uh, in women, breast cancer, uh, and, and there are several subtypes of it, um, and medicine will tell you, oh, some of them respond to hormones, some of them are hormone dependent, some of them are hormone independent. None of that is true. There's already evidence that all of them are hormonally dependent. But the most popular subtype of breast cancer in women is the estrogen receptor positive one. So even mainstream medicine, known as allopathic medicine, admits freely and openly, yes, estrogen can cause breast cancer in menopausal women. And if it's already formed, estrogen can promote it. Conversely, if we're inhibiting estrogen synthesis or blocking the effects of estrogen at the receptor level, et cetera, et cetera, it is highly therapeutic. And in fact, the estrogen receptor positive type of breast cancer is considered one of the most treatable ones because we now have drugs that are highly effective at uh, almost completely obliterating the synthesis of estrogen um, uh, through the so-called third-generation aromatase inhibitors. They're most of them steroidal uh, chemicals like exemestane, formistane, uh, uh, atomestane, etc., etc. If you look at their structure, they're actually androgenic hormones, and you know they're suicidal aromatase inhibitors. And if you take them at sufficient dosages, uh, basically your synthesis of estrogen will decline to almost zero. And it's they're known to be highly therapeutic. If uh, the medicine doesn't want to use the word curative because they would want you to mean for you to stay as a patient for life, right? Um, but they're known to be curative for the estrogen receptor breast cancer. So I thought, hmm, what could be about estrogen that drives this estrogen receptor breast cancer? And if you look at some of the older publications, they were pretty open about the fact that estrogen stimulates cellular proliferation, estrogen stimulates the oxidation of fat. Estrogen inhibits the oxidation of glucose. Estrogen stimulates the synthesis of fat, even from glucose, right? So all of these things that are, that are essentially the characteristics of the deranged metabolic state, that the first state is diabetic, right? And then eventually proceeds to fibrosis and then to cancer. It looks like estrogen is capable of, of starting or at least turning on all of these light switches that are, that are associated with a disease state, with a sickness state. Um, and, and if you look, so if you, if you start looking at some publications that talk about estrogen, especially the older ones, they're actually not shy about drawing parallels between estrogen and other hormones. Uh, in other words, what works like estrogen and what works unlike estrogen, in other words, in, in an opposite fashion. And it, it has been known since the to, uh, mainstream medicine since the 1950s that androgenic hormones work in ways opposite to estrogen. Progesterone works in pathways opposite to estrogen. However, cortisol, aldosterone, prolactin, uh, serotonin, a number of other, uh, you can call them mediators and or, uh, I'm sorry, hormones or neurotransmitters because prolactin and serotonin are technically, serotonin is a neurotransmitter, not necessarily a hormone. But if we think of hormone as a messenger substance, then all of them are hormones. And then all the publications said, look, estrogen is really a mediator, a signal from the environment that things are not going well, that you're either starving, you're under stress, uh, food is not abundant, um, you know, temperature is low, uh, you're living in some kind of a, I don't know, uh, you know, a very cold climate with a lot of snow, there's no, there's no easy availability of food, there's no easy availability really of sugar, like it's the, it was the availability of sugar that older studies talked about, is availability of sugar to the cells. And if that availability is interfered with, one of the first things that, that kicks in is the uh, so-called fight or flight response. But it turns out that it's not just, you know, they explain that we developed that response in order to run away from a saber-toothed tiger back like, I don't know, 4 million years ago. Well, it turns out that it's, can it be triggered by just about anything. And one of the fundamental uh, internal factors that trigger it is the unavailability of glucose or somebody yelling at you or you being afraid about something, right? There's this whole cascade called the hypothalamo pituitary adrenal axis and it starts with the brain but actually, 
uh, it doesn't have to. There are things that promote the, the stress response further down, uh, uh, you know, uh, it starts in the hypothalamus, then it goes to the pituitary, and it goes through the, finally through the adrenal glands. But it doesn't have to be the whole three steps. There are things like estrogen that actually promote the synthesis of cortisol, in other words, the final mediator of stress. They promote the synthesis of cortisol at the adrenal level without actually triggering the brain pathways, such as the corticotropin releasing hormone and the adrenal corticotropin hormone released by the pituitary. So estrogen actually can fully trigger on the stress response without you mentally feeling like you're under stress. Uh, and it's really very aggravating for a lot of people because it creates this almost like a cognitive dissonance. You see that you're uh, shaking, that you're agitated, but your brain is telling you that everything's fine. Um, it can drive a lot of people literally crazy. Um, so older publications were very open about estrogen not being a female hormone. They Actually, the older name of estrogen was adipin. In other words, a hormone related to fat. And it was clear in those older publications, hence the name adipin, that estrogen was intimately involved in increasing the oxidation of fat, increasing lipolysis, so increasing the mobilization of already existing fat in your tissues and dumping into the bloodstream, and also increasing the synthesis of fats from food. So estrogen was really uh, the, one of the master signals in the body telling you, look, things are not going well. Uh, we, we can, you know, we should shut down everything that's non-essential, things like higher cognitive function, reproduction, creativity, um, you know, um, you know, really joy, like the, you know, the good mood, the enjoyment of life, uh, the hedonic aspect of life. Estrogen uh, obliterates that in a matter of minutes because our, the organism says we cannot afford these luxuries right now. We need to worry about survival. And that's what really estrogen does through the activation of the fat metabolism and by suppressing simultaneously the glucose metabolism. And then again, if you look at the older publications, they try, try to uh, class uh, substances, uh, to put substances into classes slash uh, you know, groups. And they're saying, look, you think of estrogen as this unique hormone, but there are quite a few others that have very similar effects. Aldosterone, cortisol, prolactin, serotonin, growth hormone, right? Many of the, media, of the inflammatory mediators synthesized from the polyunsaturated fats they're actually highly estrogenic in nature themselves by being able to trigger the stress response, increase the oxidation of fat, increase the, oxi the synthesis of fat, et cetera, et cetera. The prostaglandins and the leukotrienes are the two bigger, the biggest classes. And actually drugs that exist that block the effects of those or inhibit their synthesis. And they're highly therapeutic for almost any disease that they've been tried for, which suggests that there is an underlying generic systemic effect that, that relates to the production of energy and relates to inflammation and relates to the stress response, that estrogen is a part of the chemicals, of the substances, of the messengers that promote that response. And there are a number of different hormones that have the opposite effect, the most uh, uh, common ones being pregnenolone, progesterone, to a lesser degree, dihydroepiandrosterone, DHEA, and in males, especially tes uh, testosterone, and ultimately, actually by far, dihydrotestosterone. Uh, which unfortunately medicine has created this this um, myth about DHT, dihydrotestosterone, that it causes prostate cancer. But guess what? Actually, dihydrotestosterone is approved for treating prostate disease, not prostate cancer, but anything up to prostate cancer, in the vast majority of countries outside of the Western world. Even in some Western countries, such as France, if you go to a doctor and say, if you're a 60-year-old male, go to the doctor and say, like, look, I have trouble peeing, um, and the doctor confirms an enlarged prostate, very likely you'll get a prescription for a transdermal dihydrotestosterone gel. Um, so, so yeah, so that's why I got interested in the hormones because I see, aside from Dr. Pete's work, which focuses mostly on progesterone, that there are a number of these different hormones that basically either promote, either work together with estrogen or work against it. In other words, either promote the sickness field or oppose it. Awesome, awesome. Yeah, so I, I visualized a couple months back that there's basically all of these uh, hormones and then signaling molecules that work in concert together and you just touched on them uh, that sort of are are the characteristics of uh, an organism moving in the wrong direction and by wrong I just mean towards you know decay or lesser organization yep. so you have uh, like adrenaline and uh, estrogen or, or cortisol and estrogen really kind of on two ends of the spectrum there where you have estrogen which is promoting growth but in this disorganized way 
Yep. Right. So it's, it's it helps you to accept energy from the environment, whatever energy is there, but in a disorganized way. And then you have cortisol, which will mobilize energy, but in a stressed and destructive way. Right. Yeah. And, and from your own reserves, which is really not a good idea usually because I mean, uh, it's even uh, mainstream doctors will tell you if your body is consuming itself, it's in general, it's not a good idea. But unfortunately, somehow the only doctors who know this are doctors who work in fields such as cancer oncologists, because most cancer patients known to all doctors that work in the field, they die from cachexia, which is the wasting syndrome. They don't really die directly from the actual cancer, very rarely, unless the cancer is pressing on some kind of vital organ, you know, or, or you know, basically does something to the brain, ruptures uh, an aneurysm or, or presses against the brain so the brain herniates. Rarely the patients die directly from the cancer. They either die from, from the wasting syndrome known as cachexia, or they usually die from the side effects of one of the chemotherapeutic drugs or radiation, which is either immunosuppression or multi-organ toxicity. So it's unfortunately, it's the only those doctors that know that your body consuming itself is not a good sign. And that's what cortisol does. It makes you consume yourself. So, and you were getting into this, there is also the hormones and signaling molecules that characterize a state of health, uh, a state of healthy growth, right? And a state of healthy energy. And I think it would be really cool to have, to hear you sort of give a breakdown and, and specifically uh, distinguish between the roles and functions of pregnenolone, DHEA, progesterone, testosterone, dihydrotestosterone, dihydrotestosterone? Dihydro, yes, dihydrotestosterone. And thyroid. Thyroid, yes. of course, being the big one. So the thyroid is, is kind of like the universal conductor. Um, I think every cell in the body has a receptor for it. So in other words, every cell in the body uh, is capable of responding to it, whether it's a deficiency or excess. Um, so basically, if thyroid hormone is not there, uh, it's, it's, it's uh, very rarely it's too much. It's usually not sufficiently there, right? And without thyroid hormone, almost nothing else works. You will not be able to synthesize any of the other hormones with the notable exception of cortisol and estrogen. Those, the synthesis of those two is largely independent of the uh, of the function of thyroid hormone which is why hypothyroid people uh, at least in the early stages of hypothyroidism tend to have elevated levels of cortisol and estrogen and just to give you another example older people in which there is a, a, again publicly admitted decline in metabolic rate in the resting metabolic rate doctors know this they're not going to dispute if you go and tell them an 80 year old male has a lower resting metabolic rate than a 20 year old male on average right um and, but what doesn't decline in older people is the levels of cortisol and estrogen. What does decline is the levels of these other hormones, and they just happen to be, in their function, largely opposing to cortisol and estrogen. And aldosterone, which is another stress hormone. It's the salt-maintaining, the salt-controlling hormone. Um, so pregnenolone, being the precursor of all of the, the other steroids, including cortisol and estrogen, has a very basic uh, structuring effect on the cell, and it makes the cell uh, much less hydrophilic. And um, when the cell is less hydrophilic, just as I mentioned in regards to the viruses, the more the cell produces lactic acid, the more reduced the cell is, the higher its affinity for water, and the higher, the more substances it's going to take up from the bloodstream. So you'll be more susceptible to viruses, more susceptible to bacteria, more susceptible to toxins. And in general, the, 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 uh, the hormones of stress are themselves much more hydrophilic. And if you produce more of them, the cell's affinity for water will also increase. Conversely, the, the hormones that tend to be health promoting, they make the cell more hydrophobic. And uh, pregnenolone is one of the most hydrophobic chemicals out there. It's almost impossible to dissolve in, in any solvent uh, in, in a sufficient amount, which me, me as a you know comp company, we try to sell a liquid product based on it, I, can, I cannot tell you how many experiments I've performed with different solvents trying to find a one that will dissolve it. And conversely, just to show you how hydrophilic some of these others are, cortisol and estrogen, you can dissolve them even in water, <laughs> and, and quite easily, actually. Even though they're officially considered hydrophobic hormones, because of their multiple double bonds and hydroxyl groups, they have a much higher affinity for water. So when you're younger, your cells are in a hydrophobic state for a variety of reasons. First, you, the fat in your organism is largely saturated and saturated fat is much more hydrophobic than unsaturated fat. 
again, due to the presence of double bonds in the unsaturated fat. Same with hormones. When you're younger, the, 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 the uh, levels of hormones that predominate in, in your cells is pregnenolone, progesterone, and then DHA starts to rise during puberty. But when you are in the, in, the, in the age group between birth and the beginning of puberty, you're basically largely a machine for turning cholesterol into pregnenolone and progesterone. Not many people know, but boys and girls before puberty produce the exact same amount of these two hormones. They're not much different uh, endocrinologically, the two sexes. It's only when puberty starts and kicks in, then basically uh, a good portion of that pregnenolone and progesterone that males are producing, uh, uh, you know, they start getting converted into testosterone and DHEA. And then in females, uh, basically the levels of DHEA rise and also a little bit of estrogen. But the estrogen, the sense of estrogen is tightly controlled. Again, even though it's known as the female hormone, the estrogen levels in a healthy woman surge for only two, three days of the month during ovulation. Before and after that, it's the progesterone that predominates because the body itself has a very good knowledge of its own hormones and knows that estrogen is not something you want to allow to run amok because it can cause cancer quite easily. And now we're seeing a drastic increase in the rates of estrogen receptor positive cancers in girls that are even pre-pubertal. Um, it was almost unheard of. Uh, it, and we're talking about rates one in a million to one in 10 million to see an estrogen receptor positive breast cancer in a pre-pubertal girl, in a pre-pubertal girl. And now the rates are, let's say one in 10,000. So, so we've, we've increased that, that rate, those rates a hundred times over the last two, three decades. Um, and that's what it's largely due to the effects of estrogen and estrogenic molecules in the environment, such as the endocrine disruptors, the polyunsaturated fats and stress. Now, I forgot to mention, I said like back in the, uh, I mean, the old studies said that certain things work like estrogen, right? Like cortisol, prolactin, serotonin. What they also said is that all of these mediators of stress, it makes sense that if they work together, they also promote each other's synthesis. So basically, um, if, you, if your cortisol is high, it's going to increase estrogen, it's going to increase serotonin, it's going to increase prolactin. If estrogen is high for whatever reason, like you have an endocrine disruptor in your body, like too, too high levels, or you're eating too much pufa, and estrogen rises as a result, cortisol, serotonin, prolactin, aldosterone, yes, will also rise. They're, they're really part of the, you, you have to think of them as a feel. It's basically a signal, uh, and every cell responds to different signals. That signal carries, it's mediated by a number of different uh, mediators, and those are these stress-promoting and stress-carrying hormones, stress-signaling hormones. Thyroid is the universal conductor which says everything's fine. The cell is producing. You should be producing sufficient energy. Uh, many of the of the uh, uh, the components of the oxidative phosphorylation metabolism depend on thyroid. So without thyroid, you're basically stuck in glycolysis. And when you're stuck in glycolysis, that itself is the signal to say, okay, we have to dismantle this expensive apparatus to perform oxidative phosphorylation. We have to revert back to the primitive metabolism, which is found in cancer, in bacteria, in amoeba, and, and all these primitive organisms exist as colonies, but without structure, just as you mentioned. Three years ago, there was a study published in Nature, I think it was editorial opinion, and it said, we've been looking at cancer the wrong way. Cancer is not something that needs to be killed. Cancer is simply a sign that the organism has given up on the idea of maintaining structure and is trying to maximize chances of survival of individual cells at the expense of destroying the structure which makes us human, right? You take away the structure of the human that makes us human, and we're nothing but an aggregation of cells. We're not the slightest bit different from a colony of bacteria. So these these hormones, uh, pregnenolone, progesterone, DHA, uh, testosterone, dihydrotestosterone, they all happen to work opposite to cortisol and opposite to estrogen. Many of them are actually directly antagonistic to cortisol and estrogen at the receptor level, which is the ultimate test that two hormones are really, really antagonistic. If they activate, uh, if they uh, uh, work in an opposite direction at the genome level, uh, even in functional medicine, even in bioenergetic medicine, the, the, the admission is that these hormones have largely the opposite effects. And so it seems with these hormones. Uh, bodybuilders, uh, one of the reasons bodybuilders have such, high, such muscle hypertrophy uh, is that they inject a lot of testosterone. They use other anabolic drugs. But the actual the term anabolic turns out to be incorrect. Older studies have shown that about 80% of the so-called anabolic effect of these steroids is due 
to these steroids blocking the effects of cortisol at the receptor. So it's better to think of them if cortisol is the ultimate catabolic hormone for muscle, bone, skin, etc. And these hormones, other the uh, you know these other steroids block its effects, then they're actually anti-catabolic, right? So what we're seeing instead of anabolic effect, we're seeing anti-catabolism. We're seeing the blockade of the effects, stress effects of cortisol, both on tissues and on the metabolic activities inside the cell. Um, so pregnenolone has a direct, actually it doesn't block directly cortisol at the receptor, but pregnenolone prevents, uh, after cortisol binds with its receptor, pregnenolone prevents the receptor steroid complex from moving into the cell nucleus and triggering all of the cascades associated with the activation of the receptor by cortisol. So you can think of it as a silent antagonist. So, uh, I, you know, I'm not going to prevent you from going on a date with your favorite person, but I'll prevent you from getting into the restaurant so you can complete the date, so to speak, right? Um, progesterone actually directly blocks the effects of estrogen at the receptor level, directly blocks the effects of cortisol at the receptor level, and also inhibits the enzyme aromatase, which is the enzyme responsible for synthesizing estrogen. Now, speaking of synthesis of all these hormones, um, if you talk to an endocrinologist, at least as far as women are concerned, every endocrinologist will tell you menopause is a condition which is characterized by estrogen deficiency. And that's complete and other crap because the enzyme aromatase is present in almost every cell around your body. Uh, so yes, if you, if, if you take a blood test of a postmenopausal woman, you will find that the levels of estradiol which is the steroid produced by the ovaries, is very low, undetectable. But also, progesterone levels will be undetectable. So at the, very at the very least, we should be talking about menopause as a condition of both estrogen and progesterone deficiency. But guess what? Even though most other cells in the body uh, uh, have the enzyme aromatase, so they're capable of synthesizing estrogen, not many other cells in the body are capable of synthesizing progesterone. They just don't have the enzymatic machinery. The brain is one, one of the biggest synthesizers of progesterone. The skin is another, right? But still, every, if every cell in the body is capable of producing estrogen, uh, and if with the age, the hormones that restrict the production of estrogen decline, then aging can be viewed as a state of relative estrogen excess and deficiency in one or more of the steroids that oppose estrogen or inhibit its synthesis, namely pregnenolone, progesterone, testosterone, the hydrotestosterone, all of these actually happen to be aromatase inhibitors. Uh, by far the most potent is probably progesterone, followed by the hydrotestosterone, uh, and then pregnenolone, testosterone, probably about equal, the relatively weak aromatase inhibitors, but still there. And because you produce them when you're young and healthy, because you produce, you produce pregnenolone and testosterone, at least in males, in, in amounts much higher than estrogen, then this is sufficient to inhibit the enzyme aromatase to the point where your estrogen levels stay low where they should be, uh, unless there is something that calls for the increase of estrogen, which is usually some kind of a trauma, some kind of a wound that needs this accelerated cell division and growth to fill in like a gaping wound. Yes, then you want estrogen to be high, but for a brief period of time, right? A week, uh, or you have a broken bone. Again, you want estrogen to be high, but for a week, at most a month, you do not want estrogen to be running unopposed, alone or together with any of the other stress mediators such as cortisol, prolactin, aldosterone, serotonin, growth hormone, etc. And endocrinologically, the hormones that restrict the effects of those stress hormones are pregnenolone, progesterone, and DHEA, testosterone, and dihydrotestosterone in males. And guess what? Surprise, surprise. It's exactly the levels of those hormones that drastically decline with age. You pick any male or female over the age of 50, and you will find, and the, even the official ranges that are used by the testing labs to confirm that, you will see that the, the levels of those hormones are at, at best 30% of what used to be when you're, let's say, 25, which is considered largely to be the peak of uh, youthfulness. It's actually not. You're already declining by the age of 25. The peak of healthiness is the age of 12. And the way you, the way you know that is you look at actuarial tables, and you, look at, uh, and you look at the chance of death, of all-cause mortality, and it's lowest at the age of 12. And then it starts rising. Actually, it's a little bit, it rises a little bit. Uh, I mean, I'm sorry, it, could, it starts declining after the age of two. It rises between zero and two a little bit, then starts dropping, continues to drop until the age of 12, and it starts rising, and it never flattens again until the very end. 
So it, it also, this decline, this increase in the all-cause mortality mimics almost oppositely, perfectly, the decline of these anti-stress health-promoting uh, steroids such as pregnenolone, progesterone, and DHA in both sexes, and then testosterone and the hydrotestosterone in males. Fantastic. So, and you got into this uh, already a little bit. Basically, it's this matter of um, cell signaling physiology and the state of health and the state of disease. And I think that it's pretty obvious that when you're 12 and you're about to enter puberty, things are going pretty well. And then you enter puberty, and especially in the case of a, you know, a young boy, you'll gain muscle really rapidly, right? If you do anything, basically, you'll gain muscle right. really rapidly. And I do think this is characteristic of being in that state of health, right? And so they don't really need to do a lot of strenuous exercise to do it. They don't need, they can keep stress low relatively easily. Um, so the question I have to you is then, how can we use these hormones as supplements to pull ourselves into that state of muscle building growth, right? Rather than the de-differentiated state of growth, a state of differentiated health promoting thyroid dominated uh, high energy, right? Right. So I think it really depends on the health state of the, of the individual. Uh, if you're still relatively healthy, you don't have a, a large amount of uh, uh, accumulated PUFA, which by the way, uh, when you're eating fat, the saturated fat uh, gets preferentially oxidized and it's the PUFA that gets stored. So almost any fat you're already carrying, unless you're making a conscious effort to eat a lot of saturated fat, for most people, any extra weight in, in, the, in the form of fat that they're carrying is going to be composed of polyunsaturated fats. And those polyunsaturated fats are not only acting like estrogen, they're also activating the enzyme aromatase in fat cells and you're producing more estrogen. So an overweight person, uh, assuming it's mostly fat, mostly PUFA, it's going to be producing a lot more estrogen. So the question is, um, what dosage and what hormone can be used to balance that effect and negate it, right? Um, so it really depends on how much extra weight you're carrying and what's your estrogenic profile? What is your endocrinological profile? For somebody who is in their 50s uh, or even older, um, I found through personal experience, even though I'm not 50 yet, uh, but I know people who are 50 and, and they've tried a few different hormones. Um, for them, pregnenolone and progesterone, they do have a very good effect, but it's mostly related to slimming down. So in other words, they're starting to lose the excess weight. But in terms of anabolism, instead of, in other words, starting to build muscle, uh, for older people, it seems that some of the stronger androgens, such as testosterone, or especially dihydrotestosterone, uh, may be needed. And why one or the other? Well, I actually prefer dihydrotestosterone because unlike testosterone, it cannot be converted to estrogen. And unlike testosterone, dihydrotestosterone itself is a stronger, much stronger aromatase inhibitor. So anyways, the, what I'm trying to say is that for a relatively younger, healthier, leaner, leaner person, pregnenolone and progesterone and a little bit of DHEA can probably do the job of slimming you down and restoring that muscle building potential. But for people who are already with, let's say, like severely compromised health, really a lot of excessive weight, most of, it is, most of which is PUFA, um, I found that uh, you know, they, they often need to supplement a little bit uh, with uh, some of those stronger um, uh, anabolic hormones such as testosterone and dihydrotestosterone. In the bodybuilding circles, they actually, they're even more, I don't want to say hardcore, but even more direct than that. If somebody uh, wants to start a bodybuilding program and they, have a, they carry a lot of extra weight, uh, one of the recommendations, the common recommendations would be to do a, a cycle uh, of using only the steroid trembolone, which is one of the most potent synthetic anabolic androgenic hormones and it happens to be also extremely effective at slimming people down so it has the effect of making you lose all, all of that excess PUFA that is on your body and after that the bodybuilding gurus will tell you okay now you can go on a regular testosterone cycle and you can start building muscle right but even they tell you even I mean even though they don't know it's it's about the PUFA they know that the extra fat is interfering with the building of muscle by continuously synthesizing estrogen and by continuously upregulating the synthesis of cortisol, right? So you have to bring this under control and bodybuilders are pretty direct. They're not that much about health.
as they are about looks, but they often coincide and they will tell a, a novice, an overweight novice, to lose that extra fat, that gut that they have, right, that spare tire, and then they can talk about building muscle. So, so uh, uh, you know, I found out that larger doses of pregnenolone in, uh, in the range of about 100 milligrams daily combined with maybe 5 to 10 milligrams DHEA um, can actually help an overweight older person slim down before they embark on a regimen of exercise. And once you are, once you, once you lose that extra fat, that, that, that extra puffer, you will find out that your, that your hormonal profile, your endogenous hormonal profile will change actually, because since cortisol and estrogen themselves suppress the synthesis of androgens endogenously and also of DHEA, if you lose all of that extra fat, all of that extra puffer, if the levels of cortisol and estrogen decline, you will unleash some, at least partially the breaks on endogenous synthesis as well. So once you've slimmed down and lost most of the extra fat, the, the amount of pregnenolone, progesterone, and DHA you use can be drastically reduced. You can go down to basically supplementing with physiological levels, which for pregnenolone happen to be about 30 milligrams daily for both men and women. And for DHEA, uh, assuming you still produce some of, some of that yourself, even five milligrams a daily are, are usually sufficient. And then if the person has some other condition, such as especially fibrotic condition, which is the precursor to cancer, then higher doses of progesterone may be needed. And many people don't know this. Actually, most doctors that I talk to don't know this, but up until the 70s, progesterone was known in medical circles as the most potent anti-fibrotomatogenic hormone available to medicine, endogenous or otherwise. And we're talking about bioidentical progesterone not the synthetic progestins, most of which are actually derivatives of testosterone, actually most of the derivatives of nandrolone, which is a synthetic uh, 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 androgenic anabolic steroid, which bodybuilders use. And even though they, are, they act a little bit like progesterone, they're also estrogenic. Uh, and many of, them, many of them are actually also cortisol promoters. So if you're talking about progesterone, I want to emphasize that we're talking about the bioidentical progesterone. So yes, for those people with some kind of fibrotic condition, uh, cancer, Alzheimer's, any kind of a severe chronic degenerative disease, uh, they may need to do a little bit of a progesterone and sometimes even on the higher dosages, 100 milligrams a daily or more for a month or two until they bring things under control. And then they go back, they can go back to a, a more benign schedule of physiological doses of pregnenolone, about 30 milligrams and DHA about five milligrams daily. That was gold. So basically, what you're talking about, rather than this, because uh, anytime you talk about hormones and exercise, everyone immediately thinks of the bodybuilders who are bursting at the seams and they have that uh, GH gut, as they call it, right? Yeah. Think about juicing and you know pushing the body to these unnatural extremes, and you know girls don't even like the looks of those guys. And really what we're talking about here is using hormones to specifically address the breaks on the state of health, the field of positive health that you may have accumulated through your uh, life, whether through diet or stress or whatever. And it seems like the big one that you're uh, pointing to is losing the weight first. Um, that makes sense, especially if it's a bunch of PUFA. Uh, I didn't realize that pregnenolone could be so helpful in weight loss uh, in older people. And I also am embarrassed to say I don't really know much of anything about trenbolone. Um, but you're saying that it helps people lose weight rapidly. Yeah. If you, if you lose a bunch of weight uh, because you're taking trenbolone and a bunch of your fat stores were uh, PUFAs, is that process, am, am I right in understanding that that process is going to be more or less stressful uh, depending on the levels of PUFA in your uh, fat? Yes, and also depends on the level of lipolysis. That's why it's not a good idea to overstress yourself initially when you're carrying a lot of uh, extra fat, most of which is PUFA, because just, just as I said, since the saturated fat is preferentially oxidized when you eat it, but the PUFA is preferentially stored, the, the, the same thing happens, but in reverse during lipolysis, which is the shedding of fat. The PUFA is preferentially released while saturated fat is preferentially kept. And what happens is that <clears throat> at this point, there are quite a few publications that show that many of the organ damage issues that people with diabetes see, 
which diabetes itself being type 2 diabetes it, itself being a, uh, a disease of fat excess and not glucose excess, right? They're wasting glucose. Uh, but at this point, there's extensive evidence demonstrating that it's the excessive lipolysis uh, in those uh, overweight people with type 2 diabetes that contributes to kidney failure and eventually even pancreatic failure, which can lead to either acute pancreatitis, which is often lethal, about 30% of the cases, uh, but even if it's not lethal, eventually it can either lead to chronic pancreatitis or pancreatic failure, which makes you a type 1 diabetic, right? Almost all of this is driven by the, uh, you know, excessive lipolysis, the, the, high, the elevated levels of free fatty acids in the blood, and most of that fat being PUFA. So while you're carrying that extra weight, you should make sure that you're losing the proper weight, which is by supporting liver function um, and then trying to maintain muscle mass, not build it because it will be stressful but maintain the muscle mass that you have, which is done by keeping the effects of cortisol at bay. Prenilone, progesterone, DHA are good at that, right? So you're restoring the hormonal milieu, the hormonal environment that you had when you were 12, right? That's what these uh, uh, anti-stress hormones do. And then after you, you get back to that level, hormonal level of a 12-year-old, uh, which means the liver will be working fine, the, the, the negative effects of the stress hormones will be properly opposed, right? Over time, as you're losing this excess fat through the process of glucuronidation in the liver and also by the muscles, whatever muscles you have left, oxidizing it at rest, and I stress at rest. That's why it's not a good idea to, to strain yourself because then your muscles at strain, during strain, they prefer glucose, right? So you want them to be oxidizing the fat properly, which is at rest, and then the liver will be excreting a good portion of it, probably about 40%. Of that will be excreted by the liver by the process of glucuronidation, which makes the fatty acids um, uh, water soluble, and then you'll be peeing them out. So you will have foamy urine. Uh, that's actually one of the good signs that you have that you have had elevated levels of fatty acids in your blood. Uh, so you don't want this to be happening too much because it means you're dumping too much fat into the bloodstream, right? Uh, and it, it can overburden the liver. It can actually give you a liver failure. Uh, it's very common. Um, it's very well known, actually, in medical circles that active athletes, um, they have elevated liver enzymes on blood tests due, uh, after an exercise or after like a, a, an event. And one of the reasons is, is that basically you're flooding the liver with extra fat and any fat that the liver cannot process, cannot glucuronidize and uh, make it available for excretion, especially if the fat is PUFA, actually has a detrimental effect on the cells in the liver those cells start to burst and start to leak those, those uh, hepatic enzymes into the bloodstream. So that's how they get detected by tests. The ALT, the AST, the ASP, and the GGT, these four enzymes associated with liver function, well, actually that are used to detect liver injury, they rise in your body after a strenuous exercise because of that fat damaging the liver. So stay, I, I don't want to say lie down all the time, right? I mean, do a decent walk. You can carry some weights, right? But if you start feeling like you're starting to, if you're gasping for breath, if you can't really maintain a conversation on a, uh, like a steady conversation while you're carrying out the physical activity, means you're overburdening yourself. So you can even run. But again, the, the test is, can you maintain a normal conversation with another human being while you're doing that, whatever physical exercise, whatever physical exertion you are? If yes, then you probably... You know, uh, you, you, you're at a good stage. You know, your, your liver is not overburdened. Your, your, your muscles are ca capable of oxidizing and handling the fat, which means they're producing carbon dioxide, which allows you to breathe properly and not gasp for breath, right? The moment you start gasping for breath, the moment you start feeling burning in your muscles and tissues, means lactic acid is high, carbon dioxide is dropping, you know, fats are taking over, and because of the Rendel cycle, you're, you know, basically too much fat and not enough glucose oxidation, and that's not a good sign. So you need to you need to scale down. And over a period of a few months, if you restore the hormonal profile, you keep the stress hormones at bay, uh, you will be losing that extra weight, the proper weight through oxidation and glucuronidation. Um, and then after that, after your hormonal profile is restored to a more youthful level, you will find out that you will be able to build muscle with a lot with with, uh, with a lot lower intensity of a physical exertion. Uh, I want to give an example that. Uh, chimpanzees that are known to be two to three times stronger than an adult bodybuilder and it, um, are actually, they don't lift weights and actually they don't climb trees that much either unless they're hunting or you're know, trying to get food. 
they spend most of their their days, most of the day and nights in a sedentary position. Yet recently, I, I you have to you can go to Google and verify it. Uh, type burly chimps in Google and go to Google Images, and you'll see that some researchers actually shave the fur of the chimpanzees completely, and you'll see that the chimpanzees are ripped, ripped. They look like miniature bodybuilders, and they're ridiculously strong without <laughs> without lifting weights, without pumping iron all the time, and without juicing, more importantly, right? So they are in a hormonal milieu, which naturally allows for their bodies to build muscle and keep the accumulation of fat at bay without most of these interventions. But we do need them because actually the life of a chimp, ironically, is a lot less stressful than ours is and a lot less toxic and probably a lot more interesting, I have to say. <laughs> yeah, fantastic. So, so in addressing the fat first as this uh, d disruptor, you know, endocrine disruptor, then maybe we can get into uh, how having more muscle is protective. And if it is, how do we get more muscle? Say we're already thin enough, right? How do we put on more muscle without causing unnecessary stress to the system? Right. So, so a couple of things. First of all, the, having more muscle is highly uh, positive. It's highly helpful. Uh, and in fact, there are uh, every single study that has looked at that phenomena has found that all-cause mortality is almost perfectly inversely correlated with the amount of fat-free uh, uh, fat mass a person carries. So in other words, your, their muscle mass. Why? Well, one explanation is that the amount of muscle you carry, muscle is much more metabolically active than fat tissue. Fat tissue actually is very good at storing additional fat, but it's not very good at metabolizing it. While muscle is, and in fact, at rest, Muscles prefer, prefer to burn fat, which means the more muscle you have, the more fat you'll burn from the diet that you're eating or from the reserves that you have without actually you doing much, right? All you have to do is maintain that muscle mass so that you allow it to burn that, that extra fat. Now, what happens if you're already thin? Well, if you're already thin, then the way to build, start building more muscle is by ensuring that you have a sufficient protein intake. And um, most people don't know it, but they're actually in a state of relative protein deficiency. And these are studies published by the FDA. Even though the F even FDA itself recommends one gram per kilogram of body weight of protein intake daily. And the FDA's own estimates are that most people are actually getting between half a gram to three quarters of a gram per kilo daily. And if you're not getting enough protein, you will be in a state of both chronic catabolism because the body actually needs uh, uh, amino acids uh, and it will get them from your muscles or from your skin or from your organs especially if you're under stress because then the body needs glucose uh, which leads me to the other thing is make sure you get sufficient glucose because if you don't then the body will get the glucose that it needs by shredding your muscle and converting it into glucose through the process of gluconeogenesis um, and so basically make sure you eat a sufficient amount of carbs but make sure those are the carbs that are easily metabolized and not the resistant carbs that are, end up in your colon. Feed the bacteria there and create a chronic low-grade endotoxemic inflammatory reaction, which is now known to be behind many, if not most, of the chronic degenerative conditions such as Alzheimer's and even cancer so, and cardiovascular disease. Almost anything can be traced uh, back down to chronic inflammation, which in most cases is driven by either endotoxin or PUFA or both. So if you're already thin, make sure you eat sufficient protein. Also, make sure that the protein is lo as low as possible on the pro-inflammatory amino acids such as cysteine, methionine, and tryptophan. And since most people, uh, you know, I mean, it it's really becomes like a very involved exercise to constantly keep track of all that protein that you're eating, which amino acid is high on, which amino acid is low on, uh, some things that you can do to inhibit the effects or even the absorption of these inflammatory amino acids in the protein is taking a little bit of aspirin. Aspirin inhibits the absorption from the GI tract of cysteine, methionine, and tryptophan. But in addition, you can, if you've already ingested those inflammatory amino acids, you can to a large degree, uh, degree negate some of their inflammatory effects by taking again aspirin uh, after, after you've already eaten, or taking uh, eating more gelatin because the amino acids in gelatin, especially glycine and proline, are highly anti-inflammatory. In fact, 
glycine is now used clinically as treatment for inflammatory conditions such as rheumatoid arthritis and psoriatic arthritis in some countries that cannot afford to buy the expensive drugs like Humira. Uh, and also it happens to be, the glycine happens to be a lot, a lot, a lot less risky, a lot less dangerous than all of these immunosuppressive drugs. Why is it important to not overconsume the inflammatory amino acids? Well, inflammation, as anybody will, any bodybuilder will tell you, is bad for muscle. Uh, if inflammation is high, cortisol will be high. The two main functions of cortisol in the body is maintain proper levels of blood glucose because your brain needs it. And number two, keep inflammation at bay. The lower it, the endogenous inflammation is, the lower the need for synthesizing extra cortisol. And cortisol is the catabolic hormone. Bodybuilders go to great lengths to block the effects of cortisol. Just as I said, most of the actual anabolic steroids are at their core anti-cortisol steroids. So keep inflammation low. So this means eat less of the inflammatory amino acids and eat more of the anti-inflammatory amino acids, such as glycine. Keep sugar intake. You don't have to go crazy on it, but the ratio of glucose to carb should be at least one to one. Because if it's not, then because of the, of the effect of the amino acids on triggering insulin release, you will cause a hypoglycemic reaction, which then has a cortisol rebound reaction, a counter reaction, because as I said, the body will do everything possible to keep blood glucose from falling because you can go into a coma. Your brain depends absolutely vitally on glucose. So keep inflammation at bay, keep cortisol at bay, keep stress at bay, make sure you eat sufficient high quality, low inflammatory protein, and if, if, if you cannot do one or more of these things, then at least supplement with the anti-inflammatory mediators such as aspirin and gelatin. And by the way, all of the steroids we mentioned earlier, especially pregnenolone and progesterone, are highly anti-inflammatory themselves. So those can actually not only have an anti-catabolic effect because they're opposing cortisol, but they're also opposing and inhibiting the inflammation, which may be very well, very well may be the top step, which is responsible for the for the excessive cortisol release anyways. Love it. Yeah, it's sort of like when you give your body all of the right things, it can keep everything in its right place. Exactly. You know, where sugar is the fuel and protein is the structure. Um, I'm chuckling here because I'm thinking about all the time that I spent trying so hard to lift weights and work out uh, when I was doing carnivore. And I would be absolutely tired i would need minutes and minutes and minutes and minutes in between my sets and then i would finally get to the end of my workout pull myself out of this hypometabolic slump and cook myself a big platter of meat and no carbs and i would eat this big platter of meat probably loaded with pufa and then i would just i became so habituated to just feeling awful and totally hypoglycemic afterwards and of course, now I'm smiling because I'm happy to, you know, be downing uh, milk and maple syrup. That's my favorite right now. A whole bunch of maple syrup uh, with a couple, you know, like maybe a glass, cup and a half of milk. It's awesome. So a couple, couple of things I'll add to that. So sure. why the carnivore diet usually not, uh, it may work initially, but why eventually does not work for bodybuilding? First, without the carbs, a, a good portion of those, of that extra protein you're eating will get converted to glucose because yep. the body can only utilize, and that's probably a good thing to mention here, uh, the optimal dosage of protein per portion is no more than 30 grams. Anything more than that will get deaminated, and I, I emphasize the word deaminated, which means the amino acids will have their amino groups stripped and turn into ammonia. So if you're overdoing the protein, you will be in a state of hyperammonemia, which is not only highly toxic for your brain, but one of the primary effects of that is chronic fatigue. And there are actually drugs on the market that bodybuilders and now actually athletes are starting to abuse, uh, parentheses, abuse, right? And those drugs help you excrete the ammonia more efficiently or chelate it. And it's, it's been shown that these drugs improve cognitive function, improve sleep, uh, improve athletic performance, precisely because ammonia is such a, is such a, uh, a toxic molecule for almost any cell in the body. Now, isn't, yes, isn't also, that where, isn't that where Ray would plug the raw potato juice? Exactly, exactly. So uh, one way to do it is to eat 
precursors of amino acids that don't contain the ammonia. So they contain the backbone. And since you already, most people have uh, more than enough ammonia in their bodies due to the normal catabolic processes of the day. And we actually have more of those because we're under stress, right? So you're going to have plenty of ammonia. And when you eat the precursors known as keto acids, they combine with ammonia and then they form this protein that you can use for building tissues while also having the huge benefit of lowering your ammonia in the process. So that's actually a highly ergogenic meal would be to either drink the, uh, I mean, eat the cooked potato juice, right? Or if you can, but they're very expensive, buy the keto acid separately and make a protein shake with those. Now, another reason why uh, having a sufficient amount of carbs is very important. The, the muscles responsible for, uh, you know, that are, that are allowing you to lift those heavy weights are the so-called white muscle fibers. They're the ones that grow in response to lifting weights, and they're the ones responsible for the explosive uh, production of force. And those are glycolytic. In other words, they depend on glucose. The, one, the other ones that are more highly expressed in endurance athletes are the red fibers, and they actually prefer to burn fat. So if you're not giving yourself enough glucose, you will not be, you'll be forcing yourself to lift you, you'll be trying to produce explosive power from the red fibers, and they're not actually designed to do that. Well, at the same time, you're not only starving the white fibers, but you're also overexerting them because you're trying to make yourself to lift that heavy weight without giving those fibers the fuel. So you'll achieve, you'll achieve probably nothing and may even hurt yourself if you're lifting weights but not providing the fast fuel, which is carbs, which is what the muscle fibers that respond to weightlifting really need in order for you to properly build those muscles. Now, if you're running marathons, then you probably, I mean, you can still benefit from glucose, but the red fibers will be just as happy from consuming fats, right? So, but if you're lifting weights, having glucose is important. Having no more than 30 grams of protein per serving is also important, unless you're a very heavy person, let's say 300 pounds. If you're a linebacker, you can probably afford to eat like 50 grams of protein per serving. But if you're, uh, you know, an average sized person, um, you know, even if you're very tall, uh, you probably up to 30 grams is sufficient and make sure that it also goes with carbs in a ratio of at least one to one, preferably two to one in the favor of carbs. That's really the, the way the way the uh, uh, a bodybuilder, a weightlifter a protein shake should look like. And it just so happens, recent studies found that chocolate milk is the best uh, uh, meal, the best post and pre-workout protein shake and beat by a large margin many of the other synthetic ones that are you know at least 10 times more expensive and advertised by a bunch of you know uh, you know very famous athletes but milk has the good ratio has a decent protein it's anti-inflammatory due to the amount of calcium it has in it and it has an amount of carbs that is in a good ratio of about one and a half to two to one in uh, in, in regards to the protein awesome so i think this will be the last question on uh, weightlifting. Basically, muscles in a high state of energy are using glycogen, right? Like you were yeah. talking about. And I think that's really what we're going for is to be able to cultivate the peaks of our metabolism to be higher, right? Yeah. When yeah. we get an epiphany, when we're working on a piece of writing or a podcast or whatever, we have this burst of energy that's fueled by glucose, right? Yeah. And by training in that way, we can increase the metabolism to, to sustain that, right? Um, so in order to build a muscle, you need to sufficiently stress it in this high energy state, right? Yep. And of course, the key word is, is stress. Yep. So my background has always been in high intensity, but low volume. Right. And also without an emphasis on the compound lifts, but rather on using machines in order to efficiently tax the specific muscle so that it gets the sti uh, stimulus and the signal to grow. What do you think of that? Uh, I mean, I think that's a very good approach. So the, there's a term called uh, lactate, bo lactate bound exercise. In other words, you, you stress the muscle. I don't want to, I don't like the word stress. It's actually you challenge the muscle sure. to the point where it starts to actually it's starving for energy and basically it's it basically it's not consuming enough oxygen and without the sufficient ox oxygen consumption you st it's starting to waste the glucose into lactic acid when that threshold right there is about the maximum you should be exerting yourself systemically and different muscle groups have different thresholds right so you need to find out what the different threshold for each muscle is 
and work up to that level. And then you stop, right? You allow it to recover. If, you, if needed, you'll drink something sweet if needed. If you gly, feel like your glycogen stores have been depleted, and they happen to be more depleted in people with, uh, you know, liver problems, which now are rampant. Uh, apparently, two-thirds of Americans have non-alcoholic fatty liver disease or something worse, right? If you're drinking alcohol, if you're doing all of these things, you, you'll probably be, uh, you'll be depleting your glycogen much faster than, than, than you want to. But yeah, so as soon as you start feeling that burn, uh, that means you already you already uh, started to overproduce lactic acid. And there's some things you can do to actually limit the amount of lactic acid being produced, which allows for more carbon dioxide to be produced. And the carbon dioxide is the primary um, uh, uh, stimulator of mitochondrial biogenesis. The more mitochondria you have, the more efficiently you'll burn uh, all these calories, the healthier you'll be. And cognitive function is now known to depend entirely on the number and density, the size and density of the mitochondria in your brain cells. And if carbon dioxide is the ultimate, if one of the, well, I would say don't call the ultimate, the ultimate endogenous mediator of creating your mitochondria, then you want to stay at the level where carbon dioxide is high. And since carbon dioxide and lactate are inversely correlated, which means you want to stay at the level of intensity that keeps lactic acid at bay. Fantastic. Fantastic. Um, so basically what I'm talking about is doing something, uh, you know, where you distribute the systemic stress by right. only taxing a certain muscle group at a time, right. right? And keeping volume to a minimum. So the overall burden on your blood sugar and your, your systemic stress is, is as low as possible, allowing for proper recovery, not working out every day, maybe even if, uh, two days off or three days off in between to allow the muscles to rebuild themselves. And yes, challenge is a better word. Yeah, so, actually, yeah to, as a confirmation of your uh, of, of that approach, you find out that people who are sick, old, or in generally energetically, in general energetically compromised, they'll have a very difficult time doing core exercises because those uh, engage the entire body, right? So they actually, and they prefer themselves. If you work with a very overweight, uh, or sick person, very often you will see that all they want to do is do like bicep curls with like small dumbbells, right? They do not want to do bench press. They don't want to do squats. It's simply because it taxes them too much. It's because it involves the entire organism. And if the entire organism is on average under a stress compromised condition, th that exercise is actually not good for them. But if certain muscle groups are stronger, right? And if they can isolate them better and stress them properly or not stress challenge them properly, right? They, they themselves feel that this is better for them. And you will find that out by actually, when you try to push them, they'll say, I don't want to do squats. I can't do squats. Give me, I mean, I'll do bicep curls. I'll do triceps extension or whatever they're called. I don't want to do squats. I don't want to do like uh, kegel, kettlebells. I don't want to be jumping up and down, you know. Um, and, you know, if they find their strong muscle group, they'll be willing to really, really push that muscle group. But, you know, they'll stay away from the core exercise. And you will see as their, as their condition improves, they'll be, become more and more inclined to do core exercises that involve the entire body. Well, it's also funny. And of course, the first thing that really comes to mind, though, is the image of the person who doesn't really lift weights and they want to uh, lift weights and they, they don't have a trainer or whatever, and they're doing the bicep curls and their gut is sticking out. Yep. And all I think is endotoxin. Exactly. Because even if you're weak, if you don't have a lot of endotoxin, you'll, you'll probably be just fine squatting or deadlifting or whatever. But the moment you have a bunch of inflammation going on in there, putting pressure on it, you know, that increasing the intra-abdominal pressure is the last thing the organism would Exactly. Want to do. Exactly, yep. Georgie, I got to be respectful of your time. So I'm going to hit you with these uh, rapid fire at the end here. If you had to pick, what would be the most common and devastating high damage uh, pro-estrogenic activity, substance, or pollutant? Uh, in terms of pollutant, uh, I would say the uh, endocrine disruptors from plastics, such as BPA, BPS. Now they've started to replace BPA with BPS because uh, EPA and FDA said, oh, we're finally recognizing that BPA is estrogenic, anti-thyroid, anti-androgenic, et cetera, et cetera. And the industry said, oh, no problem. We're going to replace it with something even more toxic. But we're checking the box. It's not BPA, right? So uh, stay away from plastics as much as you can. Stay away from store receipts which, by the way, have more, more BPA per square inch, uh, actually, I think up to 15 times more than plastics, because at least the one in plastics is usually bound. The plastic has to leach, 
which usually happens in high temperature um, um, and basically, uh, or, or the plastic is being damaged somehow, but the receipts, just by rubbing your fingers on them or like, you know, folding them and unfolding them, that's already enough to release a lot of those on your skin and they stay there and absorb. So in terms of a, a toxin in the environment, I would say that plus, of course, the polyunsaturated fats in food will be my two top because they're so pervasive, right? It's not just about intensity of the toxicity. It's about how common it is. So if it's something like radiation, ionizing radiation that you're, you know, very, very dangerous, probably the most dangerous thing you can do to your body systemically, but you only get an X-ray once a year compared to a PUFO exposure or an endocrine disruptor exposure that you're getting literally constantly 24 uh, seven, I would pick that the latter, I would say that the latter is much more dangerous cumulatively. Uh, um, another thing that r ranks right up there is, is uh, non-ionizing radiation, even though now people will tell you, uh, doctors will say, oh, don't worry, uh, it doesn't cause cancer. The National Institutes of Health, commissioned by the Federal Drug Administration, by the Food and Drug Administration, released a report two years ago, which classified EMF, non-ionizing radiation, as a probable, not possible, probable human carcinogen. So all of the stock that you see on social media of experts debunking the fear, the fear mongering about EMF, about Wi-Fi, about your cell phone, well, even now the government and its agencies, as corrupt and blind as they are, are saying you should really be cognizant of like what of this field, this sea of electromagnetic waves you're bathing in. So turn off the Wi-Fi router at night. If you don't use it, right, you'll see that you'll, you'll, you'll likely improve your sleep. Um, stay away from like electrical outlets. Like don't sleep close to the microwave, even if it's not on. It's actually always on. It's just uh, the amount of waves that it produces. It's got wires, so it has a field, right? Um, so yeah, things like that. Um, and then um, also um, really routine activity of any kind is so extremely serotonergic and so damaging to your brain um, that it has a very, very, uh, very long lasting impact that is very pernicious because it's hard to narrow down, right? It's hard to, it's hard to nail down. And if you go to your doctor with some kind of a disease years later, and everything seems to have be been going fine in your life, the doctor actually never asks you, did you work a menial job where you basically were a pencil pusher and you know nothing was interesting and you were just doing your job, as they say, and you collected a paycheck and you went home? And if the answer is yes, that's actually a, such a powerful brain toxin that it rivals the effects of EMF and PUFA and the endocrine disruptors precisely because most of us are not conditioned to think of that as a toxin. We think it's perfectly fine. We're getting paid. So in return, we are selling our freedom or our creativity or our ability to do interesting, meaningful things. Guess what? That has a direct impact on your health. Why? Because the brain is the master controller of metabolism in every cell of the body. And it also consumes 40% of the calories. So if you're doing some kind of a really boring and meaningless and soul-sucking job, you are very directly damaging your metabolism um, and your systemic health. So thank you. Uh, those were basically what I, what I thought you might mention. And really quick on the EMF one, uh, before I even discovered Ray, I was looking into EMFs and it seems like the most concrete evidence uh, is all about the voltage gated calcium channels, yeah. right? Yeah. And so because uh, the electronic signaling in the cell in the body is so uh, subtle, everything that we're using ever since 2G has blown our VGCCs wide open, right? Yep. yep. And then once I started listening to Ray, and he has this huge emphasis on uh, calcium, it took me a moment to reconcile how it's the fact that in a highly excited state, the VGCC is triggered, and then calcium enters the cell where it's not supposed to be, whereas calcium is supposed to be outside of the cell. Exactly. So. I feel like that seems like it's as uh, direct as as could be in terms of uh, estrogenic effects, right? Yeah. Also, it's the calcium will the cell will open more of its calcium channels if it perceives a relative deficiency in calcium, right. which the cell uh, itself the signal that the cell gets that there's a calcium deficiency is the elevation of of the parathyroid hormone. So if you're eating sufficient calcium and your vitamin D levels are proper the parathyroid hormone levels will go down and that will be a signal for the cell that it should not let that much calcium in, uh, that it has plenty of calcium, that the organism has plenty of calcium and it'll be much more resilient to opening those calcium channels 
even at uh, basically at the uh, uh, under the influence of, of EMF. But even if, you know if you want to protect yourself, if really under a very strong field, there's no avoiding it. Then things like calcium channel blockers, any calcium channel blocker would do. Uh, magnesium being the primary endogenous natural one, right? But there are plenty of drugs that are sold as you know as calcium channel blockers because they've also been found to be very beneficial for treating heart conditions and neurological conditions and blood pressure. So you know any of those calcium channel blockers would do. And selenium, which was found that in animal studies that through an unknown mechanism, selenium was capable of fully reversing the detrimental effect on the reproductive, the neurological, and the hepatic system, uh, which was triggered by regular exposure to the equivalent of sleeping three feet away from a Wi-Fi router uh, for just a few hours a day. That's what that's how the animals were exposed. So eating sufficient seafood and make sure, but because that's the richest source of selenium, it's probably the best way, the best source of selenium, but make sure you don't eat the fatty fish like salmon, Make sure you eat like lean fish, like cod, right? Tuna is probably not bad either. Uh, you're eating oysters, you're eating shrimp. Uh, octopus is fine too, squid is fine. Uh, those are very rich sources of selenium and selenium seems to be highly protective against the systemic detrimental effects of EMF. Love it, love it. All right, so I, this is actually the last one. Um, aside from the hormones, what would be in Georgie Dinkov's uh, bulk up, get, you know, put on mass supplement stack? What, what, would, you, what would you put in there? Um, I would say glycine. Uh, there was a recent study that showed that uh, when they were feeding old animals, older animals, the equivalent, the age equivalent of a 45 year old or older, uh, they were feeding rats protein. And then they, it's well known in, in sports medicine that the anabolic response to protein, that's what they call it actually, uh, rapidly declines with age. And then if you're feeding, if you're giving an 80-year-old a, a person 30 grams of protein, they will elicit only about 20% of muscle protein synthesis increase compared to the same, to the muscle protein synthesis response of a 20-year-old to the same protein dosage. So they didn't know why, and they tested a few, they had, they had a hunch that it was, inflammation was involved, and they fed the animals um, uh, just a few grams of glycine, the human equivalent of a few grams of glycine together with that protein, and found out that the muscle protein NPS rate of the older animal, even extremely old, about to die, actually shot up to the level of about 85 to 90 percent of the rate of the younger animal. So inflammation is key to main both maintaining muscle mass and also if you want to build it, then keeping inflammation at bay, which means aspirin is probably a great one because aspirin itself actually has an anti-cortisol and an anti-estrogen effect. It has a pro-metabolic effect, it has an anti-calcium toxicity effect, it has a bunch of different effects that go hand in hand with maintaining muscle mass. Um, and other things that uh, inhibit cortisol synthesis, I think the Cascara Sagrada is a good one because emodin, the principal component of Cascara Sagrada, is the most potent, both natural and synthetic chemical uh, known so far, discovered so far, known to inhibit the synthesis of cortisol by blocking the enzyme 11 beta hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase type 1. In addition, being a quinone, it also activates the other enzyme, which degrades cortisol, which is known as 11 beta HSD type 2. So emodin has this perfect package where it inhibits the synthesis of cortisol and increases its, the rate of its degradation. Um, and speaking of which, almost any other quinone, including methylene blue um, or like uh, or vitamin K, um, is actually really good. And recent studies show that a combination of vitamin D and K can actually has the potential of acting as a doping agent because it has such a powerful anabolic effects. Uh, some of these effects have already been confirmed in studies. Vitamin D is itself a steroid. So maybe it doesn't exactly answer your question because aside from steroids, right? But vitamin K is a quinone. So vitamin K has been shown that it, in sufficiently high doses, it triggers the synthesis of testosterone in the gonads of older males that exceed four times the synthesis rate of testosterone in younger males, right? So it has an anti-inflammatory and a pro-metabolic effect being a queen on itself that has uh, a very pro-androgenic, pro-anabolic, anti-catabolic effect that uh, very few vitamins actually can meet. I don't know of any other vitamin that can match that, can match that effect uh, uh, of vitamin K on the both the muscle system and vitamin K already has a known effect on the skeletal system 
which is for that is already approved as a drug for treating osteoporosis in Japan and many other Asian countries. Uh, and it just so happens that highly virile, highly uh, men with uh, really good health also happen to have very thick bones, very good bone health. Thinning of the bones is actually one of the first signs of impending disease, uh, even before muscle loss starts. You can start seeing like these people's limbs are getting thinner, and a lot of it is due to the thinning of the bones. So yeah. vitamin K not only directly opposes that effect, but it can actually reverse it. So vitamin K will be very high in my book, together with aspirin, because the vitamin K will have the, uh, you know, the very anabolic effect. The aspirin will also, but they also tend to oppose each other's effects on the coagulation system. You take too much aspirin, you start bleeding too easily, right? You take too much vitamin K, it may shift you a little bit, uh, you know, too much into the direction of forming clots. It is not known to cause to cause clots as in like the dangerous ones that cause issues, but it, it is a clotting factor. So taking the two together not only gives you the benefits of both, but they also tend to cancel out each other's propensity for side effects. Awesome. So I'm hearing glycine. Yep. Emodin from Cascara. Aspirin. And vitamin K and vitamin D. Okay. And, a, and that, it seems also just like a big plug for all the uh, quinones right there, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And am I correct in understanding that it's in the natural ones we've got uh, cascara, but also uh, pau darko? Yeah, pau darko has something called uh, th there's a, a whole Lapa family of quinones known as lapachones. Right, um, right. And a few of them were actually used as cancer treatments in the 60s, and the they were so successful that the, the pharmaceutical they had actually cures of of cancers in the 60s that even to this day are considered incurable, such as lung cancer and pancreatic. But they said, oh. Uh, some of these people had vomiting as a side effect. Some of these people had rashes on their skin as a side effect. It's really toxic. We cannot continue. Uh, Google Lapachol, which is the actual alcohol of one of the quinones, and the Wikipedia page will actually give you a link to those studies, and you will see that they managed to cure some of those cancers, but the pharmaceutical industry quickly intervened and lobbied heavily that Lapachol was not to be used and not developed as a drug. But guess what? Behind the scenes, Companies like Pfizer and some of their other nefarious buddies are now running human clinical trials with beta lapachone, which is the principal quinone in Pau Darko, for treating pancreatic cancer. But you'll never see it as beta lapachone. It has a technical name, a patented name that it came up with. It's a specific formulation, so they were able to patent it. And I'm sure they're going to sell for like hundreds of thousands of dollars, right? But at its core, it's nothing but a Pau Darko extract. It's the isolated quinone from Pau Darko. So we have Pau Darko, we have Emodine from Cascara, we have the tetracycline family of antibiotics, which are also quinones themselves. We have methylene blue, which is a quinone-like molecule. It withdraws electrons, right? Uh, and that's what that's what its main uh, function really is. That's, that's its main effect. It regulates the redox balance, right? And we have vitamin K. And vitamin K is a type of naftoquinone, right? And all of the quinones in Pau Darko are also naftoquinones. Vitamin K is very structurally similar to the beta lapachone. The only difference being that uh, vitamin K is a 1,4 naftoquinone, while the beta lapachone is a 1,2 naftoquinone. But still, about the same effects, the same family of molecules. Fantastic. Yeah, I was about to mention that I've actually made myself, uh, oh, cinchona, cinchona bark. Yes. Doing re research on quinine. Quinine, yes. So quinine, uh, the, the effects of quinine that I've been researching seem to be mostly related to its ability to very key things. Number one, deplete the levels of carnitine, the amino acid L-carnitine in the body. So it acts very similar to the drug mildronate. Um, and we, we are actually going to test this in one of my studies. We're going to test quinine for cancer or diabetes or cardiovascular disease or any disease that I, I, I'm able to form a, an animal model of, and we'll see if quinine alone or together with aspirin is able to help. Also, quinine turns out to deplete the amino acid tryptophan in the body. The less tryptophan you have, the less serotonin you're able to synthesize. And if that wasn't sufficient of a, of a benefit, turns out that quinine is also a serotonin antagonist, recept, uh, serotonin receptor antagonist, uh, specifically on the serotonin receptors 5-HT3 and 5-HT2. Um, so, uh, really great molecule in my opinion, um, and uh, they're saying the rumor is that the reason the British Empire was able to conquer all of those tropical countries was that precisely because of the quinine and the tonic water that they were drinking, except 
that the concentration of quinine in the original tonic water was about 300 to 500 milligrams per liter. And these days, the FDA says, oh, quinine is a scary molecule. You cannot drink it at a concentration of more than 85 milligrams per liter. But uh, so the, there's an entire book written about the, the, the expansion of the British Empire. And the book thinks that it wasn't just malaria. There were a bunch of different diseases that were awaiting the hapless Brits when they were conquering these countries. And quinine seems to have been a, you know, a, a panacea similar to aspirin, the, you know, the fame that aspirin enjoys these days. But, you know, that's what they were using. And it's much more soluble in, in uh, alcohol and water than aspirin. So they're able to drink it more. And of course, it became famous as gin and tonic, but it really was, it wasn't the gin. It was the tonic that allowed the British Empire to expand to the degree that it did. Love it. Yeah, and in personal experience, I've taken uh, Powderco and tea, I've taken doxycycline, uh, I drink a bunch of tonic water, and I definitely noticed a similarity in the effects, um, and it's, it's a pleasant one for sure. Yeah. Um, Georgie, I have taken more than enough of your time so uh, let's plug Idea Labs, right? Idealabs.dc, that's your oh, website. Idealabsdc.com. DC.com, gotcha. Yeah, you can find, to anybody listening, you can find uh, some of these substances mentioned along with many other uh, terrific, uh, high quality uh, cosmetic yes. products. <laughs> exactly. cosmetic products. Yes, exactly. Yes, for, for external use, it's because of our license, and the way we're bottling them in a university chemical lab. And basically it's just a quirk in the illegal lease. If you want to sell them as dietary supplements, you need to basically hire, uh, you, know, you need to rent a restaurant space, which now may, may be a good idea because there are a lot of them went bankrupt around me. So yeah. I may be able to do that. But until then we bottle them in a lab. So officially they're with the legal uh, statement, the legal label of cosmetics. So that's what we sell. Fantastic. Yep. And I can, can recommend everything I've tried on there. Uh, also, you're on your frequent on the Ray Peep forum at Hata. Yep. yep. And you got your own website too, where you do a, a health studies digest, I think would be my best description of it. And same, it's same thing as the Ray Peep forum, basically like the blog. I have a blog, right? Which is linked to Twitter. Yep. So anything I post on the blog gets like a quick blurb of that gets posted on Twitter as soon as I post it on the blog. The blog is heydo.me, H-A-I-D as in dog, U, T as in Tom, dot me. And then I take those blurbs from the blog and I dump them on the forum as well. I used to be a lot more active on the forum in terms of discussions, but the forum grew tremendously, which is a good thing, right? I mean, when I started using the forum, it was a thousand, actually it's 700 people, and now it's 10,000. So wow. I, just, I just can't maintain the interaction that I used to do have back in the day i was interacting answering literally every question i was getting and at this point they're becoming just way too many i mean i have a day job i have a family right my wife will kill me if i don't pay enough attention to the family so it's just right. it's just what i can do and me maybe at this point my time is also better used trying to expand the science behind the metabolic theory, theory right so i still interact with the forum it's just i try to generate more original research these days and you know, just not enough time, not enough time in the day to answer all, everybody's questions. But as the volume of knowledge and the forum and the blog grow to the person who has enough time and enough motivation, they should be able to get most of their questions answered. I mean, just the, so much information has been already generated that just searching for a keyword related to whatever you're interested in brings up, I mean, I've, been, I've actually done this with lay people. I've asked them, go to this website and search for anything of interest health related and not a single one of them was able to came, came back with an empty result. They all got more than one, in most cases, more than one threads or blog posts or Twitter posts that answered you know, their questions or at least had information that they were, could use to investigate further. Fantastic. So I'll put a bunch of those links up uh, when I put this on YouTube. Um, and then what are the odds we're gonna get a new Danny Roddy, Georgie Dinkoff coming up soon? I mean, it's on Friday, this Friday. Friday. All right. Yeah, I'll yeah. be there. Yeah. Sure. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. Best. Thanks a lot. Thank you.